Greater Centerville Historians, organized in the year 2000. The purpose of the organization is to preserve the history of the Township of Centerville, Cleveland and surrounding area. Gerald O'Neill, Charlie Bauer, Richard Wiegand, and myself, Kathleen Sixel, were the founding members. In 1831, the territory south of Green Bay was sold to the U.S. government by the Native Americans who had title to the land. The consideration was the promise of a reservation in another state. The Township of Centerville was established in 1850. The township had a village called Centerville. The reason for the hamlet's original name of Centerville was in the days of the Indians, there was a trail along Lake Michigan between Manitowoc and Sheboygan. This heavenly spot was exactly at the halfway mark, so the early white man gave it the name Centerville. In 1849, the village of Centerville was surveyed and laid out in lots and blocks. The village of Centerville was renamed Heike when the Postmaster General informed the village leaders that another Centerville was located in the state. When it became time for Centerville to be renamed a judge in Manitowoc by the name of Albert Schmidt who would take kids hiking, the judge said, you can't call a town hiking, so why not make it Heike? Thus the village of Centerville became Heike. In the early years, Centerville had the vision of becoming a lake port. To encourage ships to dock there, two piers were built into Lake Michigan. Many German immigrants arrived by schooners and the village began to grow. The village had a brick factory, stores, schools, a Lutheran and a Catholic church, mill, saloons, blacksmith shop, and a fire department, and a brewery. When the brewery was built, the settlement began to flourish. But when fire destroyed the brewery, the largest industry, there was no longer a need for the harbor facilities. So ended this chapter of the development of Heike. Two miles west of Heike, another settlement known as St. Wendell began to grow. It had a Catholic church, a general store with a connected dance hall, and a post office was also located in the complex, a funeral parlor, and at one time a motel. With the clearing of the forest, tilling of the land began. This prompted the exporting of lumber and grains. The farmers of Centerville looked forward to the building of a railway since they had a serious problem transporting their products. In 1873, the Milwaukee, Lakeshore, and Western Railroad was built between the settlements of Heike and St. Wendell and was named Centerville Station. In 1880, Centerville Station was renamed Cleveland after President Grover Cleveland. Cleveland, at that point in time, owes its growth to the fact that the township of Centerville was a rich farming community and farmers from miles around would bring products to be shipped by rail or ship. The village of Cleveland had several grocery stores, a furniture store, a funeral parlor, several saloons, Lutheran church, hardware stores, several gas stations, newspaper, photographer studio, several car dealerships, cheese factory, several feed mills, livestock yard, and lumber yards. The biggest business was the Cleveland Co-op, which offered many types of services. With the feeling of green crops, the farmers began dairy farming. With the abundance of milk, another industry began, cheese and butter making. Local cheese factories dotted the countryside. One-room schools were usually built near the cheese factories, so children would have a ride to school when farmers brought their milk. In 1958, Heike, St. Wendell, and Cleveland incorporated into the village of Cleveland. In 1968, the Cleveland Elementary School was built. The township of Centerville has seen many farming changes but dairy farming is still the primary vocation. Today, Cleveland is known as the seat of Lakeshore Technical College, which offers an educational alternative to four-year colleges. An ancient proverb states, 
When an old person dies, a library burns to the ground. These words were the inspiration for organizing the Greater Centerville Historians. We hope to preserve as many memories as possible. We have a special guest this evening, and it is Francis Sam, and he will be telling us everything he knows. And we hope we have lots of pictures and information. Uh, I want to remind everyone that please don't talk while somebody else is talking. It picks up real bad on the videos. Raise your hand when you have something to say, and then we'll talk, and you can talk when your turn comes, okay? Okay, uh, let's go around the room and introduce ourselves. I'm Kathy Sixel. Okay, thank you. Francis Sound. Good evening. Oh, uh, Frederick Jacoby. Good evening. Bernie Christ Jr. Good evening. Boris Chris. Thank you. Marie Pipper. Thank you. Lawrence Chris. Thank you. Walter Chris. Thank you. Kathy Wagner. Thank you. Dorothy Anderson. Thank you. Charlie Bauer. Okay, very good. And my name is Jerry O'Neill, and I'm happy to be doing the videoing for this uh, group. I do have one other thing I'd like to indicate. This, uh, your distance from the camera is quite a ways away, so when you are speaking, please talk uh, loudly enough for our microphones to pick it up. But I'll let uh, Kathy do a little more intro here, and uh, we'll go from there. I want to also add that Richard Wiegand was unable to attend this evening, and the name of our uh, group is the Greater Centerville Historians. And it is a spin-off from when we had the 150th anniversary celebration at Cleveland. So, I have a few photos from uh, St. Wendell, and I suppose we could start out with the dance hall, and it was tourist in. What other names was it under? Anybody know? Long time ago. Was it always tourist in? Was it always? Then it was Gretz's and then it was Hell's, right? What? Any other names? Shady, Shady. Oh, Shady. Yeah, yeah. this is right. Any mm -hmm. other uh, names at all? Have you owned it before? What's in Gretz? Kathy, could you hold that up uh, in front there, okay. please? Okay, the direction that that photo was taken, would you know what direction uh, the camera was looking? I'll let you take a look at it. This would have been toward the east, west, right? This would have been the front, right? Yeah, but then you're looking to the east. Looking to the east. You're looking... This, uh, this is the west. This, this is the west where the car is. What year was this about? Anybody can, uh, anybody remember the year of the car? The Cadillac is a... 50, 52, Pontiac is a 49 or 50, 54, 5 Oldsmobile. Yeah. That one too. That's a Ford. 53, 40. Okay, so that kind of dates it. Hi, Scott. Hello there. Come on in, we're just Anderson, and all I can remember about this dance marathon was that it was being held up there, and our dad took us up there so we could see these people hanging on each other's necks when they danced and danced. And they got a, I don't know, in 24 hours they got a little bit of a break, and then they kept on going and going. And uh, uh, Walter said he got up there too to see it. Okay. And that's all I can remember. It's like any of these that you hear about. All right. Okay, uh, I'll go over to Walter for a moment, and he can introduce himself. And what I'd like to question is, Walter, what years did they have this dance? I'm Walter Chris. All I can remember is it would have been about 1933, 34. Okay. Because uh, we had practice teachers 
and our host that time, and we went all, all went up there to watch him dance. Okay. Did you ever participate yourself? No. <laughs> <laughs> it has, is there anybody here who did do that? Was there anybody here that did join into the marathon dances? Okay. Uh, as far as inside the tourist inn, as we call it, or know it as, does anybody, can they describe the inside uh, things that were inside the hall? I know there was some special lighting, if I remember right. And uh, there was a bar, I believe, in there also. Is that correct? Anything else that you can remember about? There was a stage. Stage? Okay. Yes, uh, go right ahead. They also had a big, beautiful ball that kept circulating around all those nice colors. Okay. Like they had a palladium always. All right. Now, I also remember one thing, and I don't know this now as far as the name. There was a gentleman with bald head that used to be the ticket taker or the person that stamped your hand. Yes, a big man. There it is. There it is. <laughs> Very good. Would you like to give us information on that, please? Where, where was he from? And, uh, Chris. Yes. As much as I know, he came from the School Hill area. Okay. And later on, he moved here to Cleveland and he worked for Kenny Hill as a carpenter. All right. And in the evenings, he was a deputy and uh, took care of the tickets and the money, and he didn't want to tangle with them. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Very good. Okay. Anybody else have any information on tourist in? I can recall, I'm Kathy Sixel, recall that around the edge there was like a, a railing, wasn't it? Yes, or a yeah, railing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Completely yeah. around. Uh, completely yeah. around. And so, okay. okay. Uh, was it ever remodeled at any time, or was it always the same? Did it always stay the same? That dancing was on the inside of that railing. Yeah. yeah. And there were openings. Yeah. <laughs> Okay. Would you like to identify yourself, please, and indicate that one more time? I'm Elvin Lee, and uh, <clears throat> there were openings along that railing. On the east end, there was one on each side. In the middle, there was one, and on the west end, there was three openings. Okay. And uh, the bar that might have been in the hallway, where was that located? Do you on remember? The south side. On the south side. Okay. Was that place, did they ever have it where, uh, was it built before a time when the horses were still used to travel to this place? Was there a stable or anything below at all? Uh, there might have been a water or wood. <clears throat> it was Highway 17 when it was. Highway 17? Mm -hmm. Now that highway was... 141 what? after 1928. Oh, really? Then it was paved. Okay, so originally it was Highway 17. Mm -hmm. Okay. I have a card. I'm Kathy Sixel. Yes. And I, I have a postcard here from a wedding dance at Tourist Inn uh, dated May 17th, 1927. Good music will be furnished. And it was John Brett's proprietor, Highway 17, Cleveland, Wisconsin. Okay, I want to take a look at that. What year? 1927. That was sent out when they had wedding dances. Okay. You got a postcard like this. Years ago, they had um, probably their weddings weren't as big, and then the general public was invited to the dance. Okay. And they would send out these penny postcards. And you can see it's still one cent. And then it was run by the Schaefers from, because that was her dad. This was the postcard, and it says you are cordially invited to attend the Bergner Schaffner, a Schaefer wedding dance at Tourist in May 17, 1927. And then on the bottom it says Proprietor is John Gratz, and it was located on Highway 17, Cleveland, Wisconsin. Okay, very good. Good music will be furnished. All right. Melvin Yee, and uh, the bride was here, would have been my cousin. 
Ellen okay. Bergner. Okay, all right. And uh, where Schaefer came from, I don't know, probably Sheboygan. All right. And the Bergners were brought up right here in Cleveland. All right, very good. Thank you. Introduce yourself. Uh, Francis Salm. I remember Gretz, you know, and I remember John Gretz. And after a while, the boys, Richard and who was the post, postman? Tommy. Tommy. And then they ran it after John. John okay. was their, their dad, and he was the original owner. Okay. Well, when John owned it, was it known as Tourist Inn at that time? Is that correct or not? There were even a couple colleges there. Yeah. What was that again? There were a couple colleges there at that time. And there was also a tunnel under the road which led to a still in probation days. Really? Okay. Uh, can we have a little more pinpoint location there? <laughs> that tunnel was there until they put the sewers in, in Cleveland. Okay, and that still was located where? I guess north or west of the cemetery. <coughs> okay, very good. Okay, thank you. Power here. The, the name of the place is called Tours Inn. What, was that because you could rent a room there if you were touring the stage or whatever? Is that how they came up with the name of the tavern? And there were couple cottages there are little cabins yes. that were real close to the highway. Okay. In fact, I think they maybe were, well, they were still there when it was 141. Oh, sure. Okay, now they were close to the highway. Well, what side of the building, north, south, or? West. Really. The west side. Mm -hmm. Okay. All right. Very good, thank you. Introduce yourself, please. My name is Kathy Wagner. And I have, from the Sheboygan Press, the write-up of when fire destroyed tourist inn. Okay. And that was in December of 1983. All right. And that write-up says that the building started as a tavern in the 1800s. It was called Huffman Beer Garden originally. All right. The ballroom was added in 1923. The establishment was a hub of activity in the area and had been the scene of innumerable weddings, christening parties, dances, political meetings, and noted held even a funeral. Okay. And I had a wedding dance at Tourist Inn. <laughs> Your wedding was there? In 1949. Well, <laughs> very good. <laughs> yeah. And who was your orchestra, if I may ask? Bob Malata. Bob Malata, wonderful. Okay, any other pictures you might have of the Tourist Inn? At this from the top. I have this picture of Tristan. Okay, can you just hold it there for a moment, please? Very much like Kathy's, maybe. Oh, this is the aerial view. That's nice. Yes. Okay. Okay, just hold it there for a moment. Mm -hmm. Now, could you point out the hall and the other areas there? Was there a residence on top? Yes, and the tavern was Was here. in front there? Yeah. Okay. And then the big hall was here. Big hall was there. That hall also had flea markets. Yes. Remember, they had flea markets, and I remember going there roller skating when That's I was right. a teenager. That's right. That's right. Okay, very good. Thank you. I'm Dorothy Anderson, and I was inquiring about the store that was in that building because I have here um, Peter Huffman, the father of Frank, was reared in the, in the life of an agriculturist, but when still a young man, turned his attention to mercantile. Uh, pursuits, founding a store in St. Wendell, where he was engaged in business for 30 years. He has now disposed of this enterprise, engaged in the grain elevator and lumber uh, business in Cleveland. Well, that was at that time then. Yes. So, uh, you, Marie has something else on that? Okay, I'll go ahead. Post office, sure. I'm Marie Pippert. I just remember that there was a post office in there too. Okay. Right. right uh, with, with the grocery store. With the grocery store. Now, what part of the building was this in? Was it in the tavern part or no, connected to no, it? Almost no, almost more where the living quarters were. Okay. Mm -hmm. to, to the In the south, back yeah. to the south. Okay, mm -hmm. all right. And the grocery store was run by whom? I don't remember who ran it, but it was there as Gretz's at that time. But Okay, very good. Yeah. And what year do you remember at that no, being? You don't. Just one moment. I, Marie, on, you were talking about the post office at, at yeah. the tourist in there. Was that post office named Cleveland Post Office, or did, no. what was what was the 
the title of the post office? St. Wendell, I suppose. St. Wendell? Uh, I'm uh, Fred Jacoby. Now, I don't promise that I know, but if you think about it, uh, Heike at the post office and the Hintz family, Eddie Hintz, as I remember, okay. there was one in Cleveland, so I'm sure that St. Wendell had their own to it. That Cleveland came about first when the railroad came through. Yeah, Before all that, right. So the other ones had theirs already. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay, very good. One more thing, please. Yes, sir? I don't think it's been mentioned yet, the reason that it was called Tourist Inn for a part of the time. Yes, go right ahead. It was the tourist cabins that were on the south side of the tavern and dance hall and living quarters. Okay. There. And how many were there, do you know? Just talked to my friend Vernon here, and he yeah. said four. He walked past them often enough to know. Very good. <laughs> <laughs> were they large cabins or small? Oh, I, don't, I can't say. They weren't particularly large. None of them were. All those, they had them all over on the highways in those days, yeah. tourist cabins, they call them. Okay. And when I, my recollection is I don't think they were being used anymore by the late 40s when I started remembering them, but I can't be sure. Okay. Very good. Thank you. Melvin Yeady, and as I remember the cabins, they were about 20 by 20. Okay. Very good. And here's a picture of an ad. Okay. Very good. Now, could you point out what we're looking at here, please? Okay. Now that John Gretz was the owner, is that correct? Right. And that was the name of the store. Must have been. Yeah. Okay, very good. Very good. Thank you. And I have a little article here and it says the Heike Post Office closed in 1954 and the St. Wendell Post Office sometime before 1915. So it okay. must have only been there a short time. Okay. This really is the other post office at Cleveland. Okay, so all right. That's really of no value with uh, tonight. St. Saint Wendell. Yeah. Okay, thank you. St. Wendell. I'm Kathy Sixlon. I would like to know what happened to the cabins. Did they tear them down or did they get moved or... And where were the living quarters? What, what was there after a while? Was that all under that same roof? There was that middle bar, and on the other side they lived? Or upstairs, or where did they live? Up. Please. I'm Dorothy Anderson, and according to this picture, the, the uh, dance hall was a big building in the back here. Yes. And then the front part would have been the living quarters and the post office and the store and whatever else they had. Okay. There's two stories there, whereas in the dance hall, the second story, that isn't, that's just the air uh, and those dance Part of the roof. Up. Right. Uh, okay. Yeah. Uh -huh. All right, very good. Thank you, Dorothy. I can remember roller skating there in the 50s. Now, does anybody else remember anything about going roller skating there? Yeah. Okay. I think we got a lot of hands up here. <laughs> but did you do any roller skating there? Yes. You did? Okay. Uh, buddy, Asian. I remember roller skating in the late 40s and 50s there. Okay. And on Wednesday, it was on Sunday evening and Wednesday evening. Okay. And it also was Sunday afternoons for a while. Okay. And uh, I know on Wednesday night there weren't many people there, so we really raced. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Would you, sir, have any information on that uh, tour thing? Uh, Francis Salm. Yes. I went in the early 50s. Okay. Up to 54. Very good, very good, thank you. And you, sir? No, um, Fred Jacoby. Well, I went skating there a lot. Sunday nights I remember the most. And um, uh, you know, things weren't so strict in the late 40s and that. And so while it was mostly young people, uh, it was Richard Gretz then was running that. Okay. And the bars were open and uh, there was probably a fair amount of <laughs> Beer and stuff <laughs> being sold to people that weren't old enough. <laughs> and uh, it was a big crowd. It, it, the season, the roller skating season was uh, uh, the Lenten season. It bridged oh, that. It started already before Christmas. Yeah, but it, <laughs> okay. and then it ended with Easter. Ah, uh -huh. that was the season for because the Because then the weddings would start again. So. All right. Okay. Anybody else remember anything about those good old days? Okay, we've got a person. Ah, wonderful. Mm -hmm. 
<laughs> Introduce yourself, please. I'm Florence Chris. There were some boys that grew up in my neighborhood, uh, Robert Stein and Roman Stein. They did uh, fancy dancing you know, ex mm -hmm. exhibitions in that. Oh, okay. They really had nice shows. And, and their names again, please? Robert and Roman Stein. All right. There was another one. I can't remember what his name was. Okay. They did the fancy stuff, huh? Yeah, they did all, the, all kinds of fancy dancing. Okay. Uh, skating, I should say. Okay. Did you folks go there for a little uh, Once or skating twice. or so? Yeah. Okay. Very <laughs> I thought maybe you meant them there. <laughs> Anybody else would have any idea on the skating? Over here. Okay, just one moment. Mary Pippert. I remember it was a quarter. Okay, that's... Just skate. And I remember they had a masquerade one time, and the little uh, Gretz, Jerry Gretz, won first prize because he came in, well, he's only about this high, and he could skate backwards and forwards like a little trooper, and he was dressed like Uncle Sam. Mm -hmm. That was the cutest thing. I remember that. Very good. Thank yeah. you, Marie. Thank you. And the Red Arrow School down in Haika had their first all-school reunion in that in 1980, and yeah. we had about 180 people come to that. And, uh, and we thought we have a, we've had one every five years since, but the next five years the tavern and the dance hall is gone. Oh yes. Okay. Very good. Thank you. Buddy Yeni and this was known as Highway 17. Yes. Until 1928, when 141 was paved, and then it was called 141. Okay. Highway 17 continued from Haven south to Erdman yet in the 40s. In the 50s. In the 50s. Yes. Okay, very good. And later on, when the new highway was built, it was built on that track and then east of it. And now it's called Dairyland Drive. Okay, very good. Very good, thank you. Well, there were a lot of weddings there in, in those years in the 50s, and I remember, but before that too, but our, we had our wedding reception, dinner there, and dance after, you know, and the place is packed, you know, and that was June 58. Okay. Very and well, there were weddings there all the time there. Weddings on Saturday and Wednesday nights a lot of times. Yeah, when the oh. season was full, yeah. So. Oh, okay. And we were talking about how many people, and we're guessing 500, but I don't know. Yeah. For sure. Okay. Very good. Thank place you. used to be jammed lots of times. What was that last part you said? It used to be jammed. Oh, I'm sure. Okay. Very good. Thank you. Prince Chris, they had public dances at that time. Okay. So that's where they had the big crowds. Okay. Very good. Very good. Thank you. I didn't get to do any of that. <laughs> Thank you. I'm Dorothy Anderson, and my dad was a printer down in Haika. And he printed those big posters that were put out all over regarding the dances or whatever else was going to be, but the, yes. the dances. And he printed the postcards that were sent out. Okay. Uh, the wedding invitation, whatever had to be printed regarding a wedding, he printed. Okay. Okay, uh, just a continuation of that. My question was, uh, the wedding couple invited their own particular families or relatives, but what did they do after they had that amount taken care of? Anybody you want to... Take that? To the public. Okay, right ahead. I'll get right over to you, sir. Uh, right. My name is Francis Salm. I, have, I had a four or five sisters that got married in the 40s. Okay. And you would you would invite your relation first. All right. But then you hired a band. Okay. And then, then you had a public dance and you would send out, put out posters and cards. Okay. And some of that money or all of it, I'm not sure, went to pay for that band after a while. Mm -hmm. So they were, it was sort of an advertising campaign okay. to get more people in there. So the bridal couple didn't really have to pay for the band or? Well, they probably paid for the band, but then they, they got that some of that money back from, okay. from uh, ticket sales. Tickets at the door. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, okay, you got the, that. The ladies were uh, 10 cents and the men were 50. Okay. And I remember when, when I got married, or we got married in 55, then we went over there for for a date, and when we got there, it was already booked. Okay. So then we went some some other place, and uh, but then he called back. We could have come back, but we already had the other place booked. So. Okay. Very good. Yes, sir. Uh, Fred Jacoby. When we had our wedding there, I remember... Uh, 
the uh, the proceeds from the tickets. Yes. Paid for the band, and then there was a little money left, uh, fifteen or twenty bucks. That I remember my father-in-law handled it at the end of the evening, and he gave us that little money after he'd paid for the band. And mm -hmm. there were some other things too. I think. And okay. I can't remember. That was a lot I, of money then. <laughs> okay, I've got to ask another question. Do you remember what you paid per plate for eating that at... That wasn't the most important thing on my mind. <laughs> <laughs> I don't doubt that. I didn't worry about that. Very good answer. <laughs> Thank you. Yes, sir. I, I'm quite sure that it was uh, three eighty-five or $4.55. Okay. okay, very good. Thank you. Dorothy here, and she will introduce herself, but she's got an article she'd like to read on an advertisement. Go right ahead, please. I'm Dorothy Anderson, and I have these the Lakeland reporters from about two years of 1959 and 60. Okay. And then the various little spots all around have some advertisements. And this is the one that Gretz has had for adult skating party, March 14th. And what year was this? 58, right? Yeah, March 15th. And then here's one that, um, this is the next one that they're advertising there okay. later. Happy Easter from all the good eggs at Gretz's. Gretz's dining room and ballroom. Start a happy dancing season. Attend the Easter dance, March 29th. Very Rudy good. Pluckhard and his orchestra. Read it all, read it all. Um, good music to dance to. Attention bowlers, aim at, would we have bowling there too? Aim at Gretz's for your banquet. Oh, no. Uh, <laughs> tangy cocktails to get you in the mood to enjoy a delicious dinner served in our dining room and with the most beautiful scenes in America. Due to a full schedule of future events, the next roller skating will be held at Wednesday, April 8th, sponsored by the St. Mark and St. James Youth Fellowship. Okay. And I guess good. that goes on and on. Some on and on. Ones. Very good. Yourself, please. I'm Kathy Wagner. What else I remember about Tourist Inn or Gretz's or whatever it was called at the time, Sadie's, um, the Lion, Lions Club had their Halloween parties there. Okay. For all the kids of the area. Okay. And it was meant to keep the kids off the street and not to go trick-or-treating. They had a oh, yeah. party nice? and they gave them a goodie bag at the end of the night and the kids all came in costume and we came in costume also. And um, mm -hmm. then at the end of the evening, everybody got a bag of goodies to take home. Wonderful. But there were a lot of a lot of parties up there for that too. Very good, thank you. Kathy Sixel and the Manitowoc uh, County Homemakers used to have their meetings there too when they had them for the whole county. Okay. And also the co-op used to have their annual meeting there and their John Deere show. Both okay. of those were held there also. Okay, now here Kathy I'll bring up something we talked about in a special uh, thing we did the other couple months ago. What about the night that everything was out? The f oh, when the, when the ice storm was, or there was a snowstorm, and all the electricity was out. Okay. And then they took tractors up, and they had generators on, so that the annual meeting could be held. Annual meeting or John Deere show, I don't know which it was. Okay. Yeah. So it was a, a different night up there, too. So you had the generators to supply the electric current to keep the place going? Yep, to keep the place going. Very good. Thank you was on the 11th of March of 1975 okay and at that time Cleveland was served by uh, West Bend Electric okay and they were out of power for a week yeah. okay in that area. Yes. I lived just in Sheboygan County and we were out for a couple hours okay but uh, you but, remember uh, that one well then huh well I was uh, I was in Probably in a hundred years, that day we only milked our cows once that day. <laughs> <laughs> the power was out till three o'clock, and then that's how we got to this. Okay, very good. Thank you, Fred Jacoby. I, I just thought of some more things that used to take place, different things. Okay. You're mentioning the tractor John Deere shows and so on. Um, through, um, well, I suppose starting in '39 or '40, uh, until the war. Probably just probably a couple of years, well, then a couple of years after that, because uh, four tractors were sold by Carl Amstead down in the village, and um, they would have big uh, schools there, uh, you know, like an institute to train the farmers to take care of this new modern equipment. And my father took me out of school to take me there, 
Okay. Because he wasn't much of a mechanic, and I guess I was inclined. Okay. And he thought that'd be a good thing to do. They'd have tractors there split, you know, different ways, incredible displays, uh, you know, they used to do things like that. And then they'd show latest equipment and movies showing latest equipment and operations, and of course a good lunch all the time. Mm -hmm. And uh, that was that was one thing I remember. Okay. I, I went there a couple of years, but that probably ended then uh, by the end of the war, pretty much not much after that. Okay. And another thing was there were big music festivals there for a few years. The one I remember the most was about when I was ten years old, which would be nineteen about 1941, and all the, the rural schools here got together and did numbers together and did their own thing and all that kind of stuff. And I, uh, okay. I remember that place is full, you know, parents, yeah. people, grandparents, I suppose. Very good. Yeah. Thank you. About these wedding dances, they also advertised them in the paper. Okay. And here was Mary and Ann Henschel and Richard Yost, Saturday, okay. May 9th, and that was Kenny Ohm and his orchestra. Okay. Then Jelaine Bubb and uh, Ro Roger Goss, Saturday, May 16th, and Romy Goss and his orchestra. Oh my gosh. And they didn't call it here, they don't call it Tourist Inn, they call it Gretz's, Gretz's yeah. Dining Room and Ballroom. Okay. What right. year was that, George? Oh, yeah. The year was uh, 1959. Okay. Okay. Well, the wedding? The wedding date was May 16th for the Julaine Bubb and Roger Goss. And uh, Mary Ann Henschel and Richard Yost, that was May 29th. Uh, uh, 9th, I'm sorry. May 9th. They advertised two in one spot. <laughs> okay, very good, thank you. This paper, he found something here. If you have your wedding during the middle of the week, you get a 15% reduction <laughs> on the food for your weekday wedding. Also, your favorite orchestra will give you a more reasonable rate for your wedding dance. <laughs> Stop in and see us for the better wedding arrangements in the area, Gretz's dining room and ballroom. <laughs> Very good, thank you. Well, I'm Dolores Crest, <clears throat> and our daughter got married in 19, 1977. Okay. And she had her reception at, uh, well, it was Stays that time. Okay. And, uh, well, it was just, Relatives and friends that were invited. Okay, very good. Well, they had a band and sure. dancing, but okay. it was Let me it ask. wasn't open for the public. All right. Now, getting back to Gretz's and Steggy's and uh, Tourist Inn, there was a dining room, if I remember right, a smaller dining room behind the main bar? Yes. Is that correct? Right. right. Okay. Very good. I'm Florence Cress. Our daughter had her wedding reception in that little, they called it the side room. Yes. Oh, yeah. Okay. That's where the main church never. Seven Okay, very good. Thank you. My name is Kathy Wagner. And in years back, during the season of Lent, there were no weddings. We could not get married during the season of Lent. Okay. And when did the, the thing, uh, the season start again? to be able to uh, have a wedding? Right after Easter. Right after Easter. Right after Easter. Okay, thank you. And when did it start? Were this, this, uh, you couldn't have anything, right? The start of Lent? Is that the start of Lent. Okay, very good, thank you. And uh, there was a funeral home in Tadewell at one time. I think it was built in 39. Okay. And uh, it was about 1950 when it closed up. I'm guessing, yeah. Okay. Do you know the owner of that? Yeah, his name was Pete. Pete, Pete Nenish. Pete, what is his last name? Yenish. Relation to you or no? No. You're Yenik and that Yenik. That was Nenny. Nenny. Could you could you spell that, please? N e n n i g. Okay. All right. Very good. And where was that located now? It's uh, still there. Yeah. Who lives in there now? Apartments now. Oh, I think it's. Uh, Would you have some information there, please? Uh, this. Could you give your name also, please? Uh, Francis Salm. Yes. This funeral home was about uh, three or four houses north of Gretz's okay. bar. All right. And uh, I know it was my dad was 
died in 48, and he was, he was laid out in that funeral home. All right. Uh, okay. But I think they were, they closed shortly after that. Okay. Um, I think Peter Denny moved down to Florida after a while. Okay. All right. Just one second, please. Go right ahead. My re recollection is pretty good, but I can't guarantee it, that uh, Pete moved his business to Sheboygan on North Avenue, just west of uh, Memorial Hospital. On a, it was on a corner there. I can I remember that I can drive past and I recognize the building. Okay. So, and they maintained, I think maybe he joined with somebody else at that point. All right. And uh, maintained a funeral home facility there. Okay. And his first name again was? Peter Nenick. And he's, he ran the original funeral home here in St. Wendell? Well, the one original, I don't know, but the one that was there, as right. say at 38 or 39. Okay. Anybody else have any information on that area? Okay. Anybody? Yeah. Hey, Pepper, I don't remember the time, but Milton Ewald bought that, bought that afterwards, the, the funeral home. And I remember his wife, Kay, had a beauty parlor upstairs. Okay. In, in, in the funeral home. Okay. But I don't remember when he bought that from Peter Nenick. Milton Ewald. Milton Ewald. Okay. Thank he, you. He originally came from Haven, Milton. All right. And he made a residence out of this and a, and a hair... Dressing. He had the regular funeral home downstairs. Oh, he did? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah. Okay. I think he bought it that time from Peter Nenick, and then she had the beauty parlor up there. Well, she was, come to think, she was Kay Gretz, now yes, that I think was. of it. Yes. Yeah, yes. she was Kay Gretz, his okay. wife. Okay. Mm -hmm. They're both living here, as far as I know, in Florida, I think. Mm -hmm. Florence Gretz. Yes. And Dr. Fire was a very good doctor, and if we wouldn't have had him, we wouldn't have our first daughter. Okay, very good. So and do you know where his office was at that time? At that time, he had it at Villeneuve Home. At where? At that home, the Villeneuve Home. And where was that? Frank Wagner's farm. Just south of uh, St. Wendell Church. Okay. To the southwest. All right. And could you say that one more time, that his home, that home that he was in, was called what? The Velanoff. Velanoff? Velanoff, yes. Okay. If I it right. All right. Was Frank Wagner's farm? Yes. Yeah. Yeah, yes. Okay, would, would you like this? Okay. Marie, you want to add a little bit to that? No, I just remember that was Frank Wagner's farm. Okay. Before it was uh, the, the doctor's place. Mm -hmm. All right. Hmm? Yeah. Yourself? Uh, I'm Francis Salm. Uh, Dr. Fighter must have come into the town about 45, 46. Okay. And and lived in Villanoff's house, and then he built his new buildings just on the north end of Cleveland. Okay. Uh, I'm not sure what year he died. Okay. Probably late 60s. Okay, another gentleman has his hand up, right ahead. I'm Fred Jacoby. Um, um, my father died in November 57, and we got married the next summer, and he died within a year or two after that. Okay. Unexpectedly. All right. He died in 1960. I was pregnant with Alan. A couple of dates and things on uh, Dr. Fighter. Would you like to introduce yourself? Kathy Wagner. Yes. And Dr. Fighter dropped, dropped dead in Holy Name Church in Sheboygan. Really? On the Saturday before Mother's Day. Okay. Uh, the year 1960. 1960. And you remember him also as far as? I remember him all. He delivered all my children. Okay. And how many children did you have? I had three children. Okay. And then I was pregnant with Alan, and then my doctor died. Okay. Well, very good. Thank you. Introduce yourself. I'm Florence Chris. Well, if he came in 45, my daughter was the one that was born that he saved her life. Yes. She was born in 47. Okay. And, uh, well, like she said, he died in 1960. All right. So 15 years. Okay, very good. Thank you. Introduce yourself, please. I'm Dorothy Anderson, and the home where Doctor had his office became a dental office uh, from a from some people from our um, outfit from Manitowoc and they came out on Tuesdays and Thursdays and had dental office in, in that building until okay. they closed that part. About three, 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 three dentists three, and uh, 
when did they come back? I went up there to the dentist, and then I had to go to Manitowoc to continue. So that's about three, four, five years ago okay. that they moved out. All right. That's the um, Lakeshore Dental. Lake All right. Very good. Uh, did Dr. Fighter live in the same building that he worked out of? Yes. Okay. Very good. Thank you. Oh, so please. Buddy Yee and uh, Kevin Neroni was a dentist in there before uh, <clears throat> Lakeshore Dental moved in. Okay. He, I think he only worked about two years. Then he went to Chilton or somewhere else to work for a different okay. dentist. Very good. And then Classic and Allison, Allison. Allison were All right. in there until they built their Lakeshore Dental and Manitoba. Oh, okay, very good. Thank you. Patient, go right ahead, please. Buddy Eddy, Dr. Fighter was a dentist, a doctor that was trained in the Army. Oh, really? And after he got out of the Army is when he started his practice here in Cleveland. Okay. Did he live around this area at all, or was he from? He was from Southern Sheboygan County. Oh, okay. Okay, very good. Thank you. Just help, please. I'm Kathy Sixel, and if I. Uh, uh, recall my memory correctly, Margaret Miller is a, was a sister to our, no, is a sister to Dr. Fighter. Okay. And does she live in the vicinity here at all? Right. She lives near Cleveland. Okay. Very good. Thank you. Introduce yourself, please. I'm Marie Pippert. I have to tell you a little story. I remember Dr. Fighter. My daughter was born April 10, 1947. Okay. And then he had his office up there, which was Frank Wagner's farm. Yes. And she was only two weeks old and kind of a crybaby. Yeah. And that day I had baked bread and it got a little brown at the bottom. <laughs> so I was going to go outside and scrape it off and I took a long butcher knife and did that. And because she was crying her head off, I ran in and the knife got caught in the door jam and it sliced my hand open here. <laughs> Oh. And I was bleeding like a stuck pig and nobody around. <laughs> and my mother was with us at that time, but she was in the garden with my brother. But then Hazel Pippert was over by Grandma Pippert. She was a nurse. So she took me up to Dr. Fighter, and there were so many people in there. But when he came out, he just look, took a look at me and says, you're pretty green. I better take you first. <laughs> and he put real many stitches in. And, and on the way back, Hazel said, boy, you really look green. We really should stop for a drink. <laughs> forget that. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Marie. Yep. <laughs> Please. I'm Walter Crest, and I used to work in the Hudson garage here. Yes. When it got below zero, Dr. Fighter would call up. His car wouldn't start. Yes. We'd take the wrecker, and we'd go up there, and we'd push him out on the highway. And when it got south, there was a big hill. We'd just floor it. When he got in the middle of the hill, he threw it in gear, and away he went. <laughs> <laughs> you had to keep it running all the time, huh? Yeah. Big Nash, that time. Big, what color, what kind of car? Nash. A Nash. What year would you happen to know that? About 47, 48. Okay. Had a tough time starting her, huh? Right, but it's got below zero. Okay, thank you. My dad died in a uh, friend's sum. My dad died in '48. Yes. But the last two, three years, he had Parkinson's. Okay. He had trouble moving around. Yes. And he came to our house to uh, to take care of my dad. And this is uh, Doctor Doctor Fighter. Fighter did that. And then in the later years, in uh, 1953 to '55, my brother had. Uh, rheumatic fever, yes. and then he came also on a regular basis and would stop to see him. Amazing. Yeah. That was done in those days. Okay. Anybody else have that? Yes, go right ahead. Well, uh, Dr. Fighter, of course, did this, but I think a lot of the country doctors did, and for that matter, doctors in the city did it. Uh, we moved into Mantua in 61, and doctors would still come to your house when the kids were little and real sick. Okay. But I think it disappeared pretty quick after that. Yes. Okay. Thank you. Yourself. Yeah, I'm Florence Chris. Well, Dr. Fighter would come down and see me when I was pregnant with one of my children. Okay. See the children. Yes. But that makes me think of Dr. Dr. Reiner. He would come to our house up in San Wendell. Okay, now Dr. Reiner. Okay, he was located where? Cleveland. In the village of Cleveland. In the village of Cleveland. Okay. His house was right next to ours. Right next to Okay. <laughs> you tell her where you lived. <laughs> Marie, you want to give a location on that home? That uh, Dr. Other? Reiner was um, right at what is now the Main Street, Washington Street, right across from uh, just about Yost's warehouse. Okay. Yeah. Well, it was William Table Hardware Store at that time. Yes. 
Okay. And uh, he was a regular old country doctor. Okay. But he shook like crazy. Everybody was scared of him. <laughs> <laughs> Very but, good. Uh, Thank he you. He was a real good old country doctor. Thank you. It's Chris, and she talks about him shaking. And my brother had scarlet fever. So the little ones all had to have the shot, you know, the scarlet yeah. fever shot. And he comes. <laughs> and you sit there. Mm -hmm. I'll never forget how I was shocked. But he hit his mark. Yeah. Oh, okay. Very good. Very good. Baby doctor. Oh, yes, he was very good. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Who has a special story? Go right ahead. Buddy Andy, I have my nickname is my real name is Melvin, and my nickname is Buddy. And yeah. that was from Doctor Reiner because when I was born, he tickled me under the chin and called me Buddy, oh. and that stuck. <laughs> that stuck. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Introduce yourself. Marie Pippert, uh, we were getting back to Grafts. I just happened to run into okay. Richard, uh, Richard's wife today. Okay. And, uh, yeah, Richard Grafts' wife. What was her, did I say her first name was? Jen. 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 And she told me that she's 83 years old, but she walked with a cane and has arthritis real bad. Otherwise, okay. she's real good. Does she live in the village here? In Sheboygan. In Sheboygan. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. Well, it was odd that I just ran into her today. Yeah, very good. Thank you. Now, that was Richard was the... Richard was a son of John Gritz. All right. Oh. Okay. Mm -hmm. Very good. Thank you. Mm -hmm. And uh, indicate a little update. Kathy Wagner. I, I think I said Dr. Feider died in 1960, but he died in 1959. He must have because my son was born in 1960. Okay. All right, and you said something about Mother's Day or something, or some special day that he, he died. He died the day before Mother's Day. Okay, very good. Thank you. Introduce yourself, please. Francis Salm. Uh, Doc Fighter was only 38 years old when he died. Oh, really? Oh. Going, going to confession on a Saturday afternoon yeah. at church. No kidding. Oh, that is a young age to go. He had five or six kids. Yeah, pretty good sized family. She okay. Was born after he was yeah. after he died. She was pregnant with Arnie because Arnie was born. Yeah, Alan, who are dentists. So please. Kathy Wagner. Okay. I just wanted and to say that. <laughs> Doctor uh, Fighter, uh, his wife was. Doctor Fighter's wife was was pregnant when he died. Okay. And and his son was born in 1960. Also, he's the same age as my son. Okay. He was born in 1960. And the other sons and did what? And there are two what? sons that are now dentists in Sheboygan. In Sheboygan. Okay, very good. Thank you. Uh, I think we have identified all the industries and businesses that were in the uh, in St. Wendell. So now we would like to uh, discuss the St. Wendell Catholic Church. Okay. And uh, we have lots of pictures, and I'm sure there's lots of people that have lots of memories of the church. Okay, very the good. The church closed this year, right, or last year? This year. This year. And that's, this year is what year? This year is 2002. Okay, and do you know when, what month they might have closed? Anybody? June 30th. June 30th. Okay, I'll, we'll find out who knows that. Yeah. The lady here would like to say a few words. Introduce okay. yourself, please. It's Dorothy Anderson, and this is from Manitowoc County Footpaths, so our heritage. I've taken this way back. And uh, in uh, May 31st of 1853, the St. Wendell Parish uh, was established, but the structure was built in 1895. At, at first, the mission of St. George, that's the one down in Haika, okay. and later St. George was the mission of St. Wendell. All right. I don't know why I get that 1853 so early. Okay, very good. Thank Here's you, Dorothy. a picture of... of okay, great. From um, the south west looking northeast okay. in uh, about 1926. All right, very good. That's excellent, Dorothy. Okay. We've got a picture of the St. Wendell Church. Maybe somebody can read the caption underneath and indicate where we're looking. Dorothy Anderson. This is, in the front here it says, front view of St. Wendell's as it appeared in 1909. Okay. And you're looking from the northwest to the southeast. Okay, very good. All right, thank you. 
Okay, uh, would you like to introduce yourself and indicate what you've got there, please? I'm Kathy Wagner, and I have here our 1988 directory of St. Wendell Church with a picture of the church on the front of the book. Okay. We've got a picture here in a booklet, and maybe the gentleman could identify himself and indicate what we're looking at. Uh, I'm Francis Salm. Okay. That was a two-room schoolhouse with a um, house for the nuns where they stayed okay. when they were teaching. Yes. And uh, I went to school there from all my eight years, from 1940 to 48. Okay. And it was a, like a one-room schoolhouse? Uh, or? A two-room. Two-room schoolhouse. Four, they four grades, and then the top four grades were on the other side. Okay, okay. And uh, the nuns, as the nuns you, were, were the we teachers? Had all nuns teachers. We didn't have any. Okay, and how many nuns would teach? Well, there were just uh, one for each room. Okay. And then they had a cook sister. They had a okay. that was a, a cook. All right, okay. And uh, the amount of children that you might uh, can recall when you were going, uh, would you happen to know any kind of number? of uh, youngsters that went there at that time? It's Roughly from 60 to 75. Okay. Oh, okay. Very good. 80 maybe. All right. How many did you have in your class? Seven. All right. Okay. Okay. Now, I guess we've got some writing on, on the page, and if you'd like to read that, please, we'd appreciate it. Up on the whole page. St. Wendell Church. St. Wendell Congregation dates back to May 31st, 1853. 51 German families contributed to a fund for the erection of a church and to support the priests who came to Sheboygan to provide spiritual needs. Before the erection of the first church building, mass was offered at the William Knauf residence in the town of Mosul and in the Joe Schulte residence in the town of Centerville. Property for the erection of the first church building was donated by Stephen Grasser, who gave a parcel of land from his farm. The first church was erected about in the middle of what is now St. Wendell Cemetery. Under the patronage of St. Wendell, the first church of log construction was erected in 1854 and dedicated in 1855. Priests coming from Sheboygan served the parish from 1855 to 1861. In 1860, it was proposed to build a larger church for the increased membership of, of St. Wendell. Meanwhile, Catholics living at, the, at Centerville, then a flourished village on the shores of Lake Michigan, two miles east of St. Wendell, obtained permission to erect a priest's house and a church with the understanding that a priest would be stationed as pastor of the new parish and St. Wendell would be attended as a mission. The church was erected at Centerville under the patronage of St. George. Reverend Joseph Rebel was appointed pastor with St. Wendell as the mission. The members of St. Wendell never quite gave up on their own, on their project of a new church and work was begun in 1863. The new church was erected north of the First log church and dedicated on October 20th, 1864. In 1865, under Father Weiss, the first parochial school was established at St. Wendell. The original log church was converted into a school and the first teacher was from St. Adrian's mm -hmm. Convent. A home for the teacher was provided in a dwelling north of the present boundary line of the cemetery, which was later enlarged, and the school transferred from the old log church to this building, which served for both school and residents for the teachers until the brick school on the east side of the highway was erected. From 1865 to 1871, <coughs> while St. Wendell was still a mission of St. George of Centerville, funds were collected to build the priest's house and a two-story frame building was put up north of the frame church. 
from 1871 to 1875 under Reverend J.H. Carhage. The priest's residence was transferred from Centerville to St. Wendell and St. George of Centerville became the mission. In 1880, Reverend J.P. Van Treek became pastor of St. Wendell. In 1881, two acres of land were purchased on the east side of the highway for the erection of a new one-story building of brick construction with an addition as a home for the teachers. From 1864, to 1872, Sisters from St. Asian Stoss School. From 1873 to 1884, the Franciscan Sisters of Charity from Alverno Thought School. From 1984 to 1890, Lay Teachers Thought School. From 1893 to the closing of the school, teaching duties were performed by Franciscan Sisters. Father Held Stern was pastor from 1882 to 93. During his tenure, the parish of the St. Wendell was incorporated on August 8, 1883. A two-story priest house <clears throat> was built in 1893 with much of the labor donated by the parishioners. Father Oleg was pastor at this time. The house still stands and was moved to a location south of the church when it was vacated and sold in 1972. On Christmas Day in 18. 94 with the Reverend William D. Jolly was as pastor, the old frame church burned to the ground. On January 10, 1895, a building committee was chosen for the erection of a new church and building began that spring. Between 1898 through 1903, the school and sister's house were enlarged. The interior of the new church was painted and decorated, and the new boundary lines between the Archdiocese of Milwaukee and Green Bay were established, putting St. Wendell under the supervision of the Diocese of Green Bay. On October 20th, 1905, under the pastorship of the Reverend R. Nickel, the Golden Jubilee of the congregation was celebrated. Up until 1907, school had been taught in the German language and during, during Father Kuhl's term as pastor, the English language came into being in the school. The rectory was modernized and cement walks laid around the church. In 1950, with Father, with Reverend R Roder as pastor, the church was enlarged. Reverend Henry Letts was pastor from July 7, 1923 till May 14, 1927, and extensive work was again done on the church. One half acre of land was added to the church property in order to provide larger playground facilities for the school children. Father Emil Schmidt succeeded Father Letts as pastor in 1927 and served until 1934. In 1930, a new sister's house was erected. The Reverend Talindi served as the parish, served the parish from 1933 to 1937. Father Theodore Kirsten from 1937 to 1940, and the Reverend Joseph Schaefer from 1940 to 1950. During Father Schaefer's term as pastor, extensive work was again done on the church and the church property. In 1947, considerable work was again done on the cemetery and the church basement was completely done over and a kitchen installed. Father Lurkey followed Father Schaefer in 1950 and 51, the Reverend Richard Keller, Reverend Richard Keller served the parish from 51 to 57. Early in 1952, St. George's Church in Haika closed with the members of that parish being transferred to St. Wendell's Parish. At a meeting of the members of that parish in 1952, it was decided to construct a new school to overcome the crowded conditions of the present school, and plans were approved for a new construction. A building fund was set up, and in 1956, the new school was built during Father Keller's ten tenure. In 1955, the 100th anniversary of St. Wendell was celebrated. From 1957 to 1965, Reverend Leo Ott was at St. Wendell. He was succeeded in 65 by Reverend uh, Jerome Watry, who remained until February of 1970 when Father Tom Peters 
came to St. Wendell. In 1972, St. Wendell School closed. Father Peters moved into the vacated sister's house. With the vocation of the priest's house, the building was sold and moved to another site south of the church where it was converted into a two-family dwelling. Okay, well, very well done. Thank you very, very much. Uh, I graduated from St. Wendell School in 1934. I okay. went there for three years. Three years, okay. Yeah. Uh, it was uh, two rooms. Yes. First four grades were in one and uh, upper four in the other. Yes. One nun to each room. Okay. There was no way that she could handle us all. Oh. And uh, the way you behaved is the way you were seated. Okay. If you didn't behave, you were up front. Yes. And this nun was already over 50 years old. Yes. And when she talked, she really spit. You've got a shower. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, a lot of times uh, you had to say after school. Yes. And she'd stand in the store, uh, doorway and talk. Yeah. And they had these sliding windows with weights on them. Yeah. And I'd have somebody outside with my clothes and lunch bucket. And they'd open the window and I out. <laughs> I was home before she noticed that I was gone. <laughs> uh, do you remember how many children were in your class? Well, uh, in my class, yes, about uh, eight, ten. Oh, okay. All right. Anybody only in this? Two of us left. Only two of you guys left, huh? Mm -hmm. Okay. And that was back in '34, you say? '31 to '34. I went All right. Up there. Very good. Uh, do you happen to remember the, the nuns' names? Ours was Sister Julian. Sister Julian. Okay, very good. I remember good. in 1950 she was still teaching. Okay. She had to be way in her 80s. Oh my goodness. How she took it, I don't know. <laughs> okay, very good. Uh, know. She was going to hit a guy one day. He wasn't behaving. Yeah. And she said, stick out your hand. Uh oh. And she, the guy did. And as she started with the ruler, he pulled back his hand, he, she hit herself on the knee, and she started to cry, and we didn't see her for the rest of the day. <laughs> okay, very good There's memory. There's no way she could handle us. No, no. Uh, Yourself? Verlin Chris, uh, going back to this uh, St. Wendell School, there were two rooms, and uh, there was four grades, the first four grades were in one room, and the upper four were in an, the other room. Okay. And there was a hallway in between. Okay. And then on one end was a little chapel where we had to go in the morning. Okay. We had to get on the good side of the Lord before okay. we went to school. Okay. And uh, let's see what else was there. How many total on each oh, half? Would you know uh, that? There was about 40 on each side. So one nun on each side had to take right. care of that quantity right. of children. Mm -hmm. Wow. And the seats were all doubled. Oh. You, like I had a br younger brother. I had to sit with him. And okay. If you had a brother and a sister, they had to sit together. Okay. So. Now, you mentioned, and I'll continue, a little bit of the disciplinary things that the nuns used on these uh, wild youngsters here. Oh, yeah. uh, what other means of discipline did they use? Do you remember anything on that? Uh, I know you said something about maybe a spanking or anything. Oh, no, no. No well, spanking. tried to hit you over the head or the hand with a ruler or something okay. like that. Okay. The guys would wind up the old alarm clock, you know, they weren't supposed to touch it. And okay. One guy brought frogs to school. They were <laughs> jumping all over. <laughs> very good. Thank you very much. Off again, please. I'm Francis Salm. I went to school there from eight years, from 1940-48. I thought we had very, very good discipline when I was there. Okay. If there was any questions, then father would get involved. Ah. And he would also come all eight years. He came to school every day for the catechism class. Okay. Now, Vernon mentioned about some religious thing uh, before the classes started. Did you have that also? Yes, we had okay. mass the same way as he did. We okay. used that first, the smaller grade school, and that was hooked up with the chapel. Okay. So that we could accommodate all the kids. So you walked into the church area first, is that right? Or? No, this was at the... This was in the lower, the, the first four grade room. Yes. Was they opened the door and then the chapel was on the bottom end. Okay. And they, uh, you sat fairly close together. Okay. But in the 40s, we had our own desk that we were not sitting double. Okay. All right. 
Okay. And do you remember the uh, nun that might have been uh, teaching you? I had three nuns in eight years. I okay. had the uh, first four grades, I had Sister Emanuel. Okay. Uh, and then I had one for the fifth, sixth, and seventh grade, and one for the eighth. I don't remember their names. Okay. And the priest again at that time? Was, uh, was Father Schaefer. Father Schaefer. Okay. Very good. Thank you. He was, he was also great. He was with us in sports every day with baseball and in winter time we'd play basketball down in the church and okay he was just a great uh, okay we have a picture in front of you would you like to indicate who that is please this is father schaefer that is father schaefer okay and how old would you believe he was at that time when he was involved with your school i would say he was in his 40s okay very good. Thank you. Uh, I'm Francis Salm. This picture is of Father Joseph Schaefer, which was taken in 1951. Father Schaefer's age went with the year. He came to St. Wendell in 1940 at the age of 40 and moved to Shano in 1950. At the age of 50, well, he died in Shano in 1864 at the age of 64, where he was still where he still, if he'd still be living, he would, he would now be 85. Okay. This, this was picture was taken in 85. All right. This okay. So he went with the year. He, he died of kidney infection resulting from neglecting to get a prostate operation. Like all of us, he had a fear of the doctors, which is all the more amazing because he had so many good friends who were doctors. Okay. Thank you. Introduce yourself, please. Uh, Fred Jacoby. And uh, I went to Lutheran Church, but I got to know Father Schaefer because he came to our farm uh, any number of times when our rural school closed because he was looking for seating. And that's probably, and, and he did this with other schools too, because all the rural schools were closing yes. in the, well, middle to late 40s. And he was getting equipment from those schools, and that's probably when they replaced those double seats. Up, okay, you know? all right. And so he was at the farm many times. My father happened to be the clerk of the school, which was across the corner. That okay. That was the deal. Okay. And uh, I remember him as a very, very uh, pleasant person. Okay. And it bears out what Francis just said. Sure. About him. Very good, thank you. Yes. This is Walter Chris from Florence. Uh, you're talking about Father Schaefer. Yes. He married us in 1946 at St. George's Church in Haika. Okay. And St. George's, was that the, uh, the, mission the mission church? at was that? the mission church at that time. Oh, okay, very good. Very good. Okay, Florence. And this is a picture of the school in the chapel, St. Wendell School in Chapel. Okay. And uh, this is the nuns. Home. Okay. And that was taken in 1930. Okay. And would you know what side of the church that was on, please? South. South side. Yeah. Okay. See, and that's where they built the new school on. On to that. Yes. Okay, very good. Okay, thank you. The gentleman here who can give us a little information on a sheet of paper he's got on his hands. I, I'm Francis Salm. I have a picture of the first graduating class from the St. Wendell School in 1910 or 1911. Okay. There were four kids in that graduating class. One was Frank Retley. Could you point him out, please? Okay. And the other boy was George Helm or Heim, okay. H-E-I-M. The girl at the left was Clara Bogenschitz. Okay. And the other was Annie Salm. Okay. Now... Annie's dad lived on our farm, and he got killed in 1897 when the horses ran away in Cleveland. Broke his neck or whatever, I don't know. And she was just buried up at St. Wendell Cemetery within the last two or three years. Okay. Those nuns that are pictured with the class and the 
priest in the background? Do you know who they are? Or are they, is there something written there that uh, you could read to us? Sister Esselman and Sister Jeanette Sandville. Okay. And this is the first class coming out of St. Wendell? Yes. Okay. And what year again was that? Either 1910 or 1911. Okay. Very good. Thank you. It's off the record? <laughs> I'm, a, I'm, I'm setting this up. Okay. Introduce yourself, please. Uh, this is Francis Salm. I have a snapshot of the graduating class of 1932. Okay. And do they have a uh, first row and that type of thing? Well, in the first row is uh, Art Salm. Okay. And Charles Fredericks, which he later was a priest. Okay. Helen Bogenschitz married to Colby. Okay. Harry Johannes. Esther Schmidt married to Noel. Okay. George Van Loo, And then his sister Angie Van Loo. All right. In the back row is uh, Lawrence Wagner. Okay. He's still alive, living in Sheboygan. Lorraine Yost. Okay. Gertrude Sarm. Sam. Okay. Hillian Hauch. Mary Wagner. Florence Fox. Herbert Wagner. And Sister Julian. Okay. And the priest was who? Father Emil Schmidt. Okay. Very good. Thank you. She would like to introduce herself and with some information. Kathy Wagner, we have in this book uh, a picture of St. Wendell Church as it appeared in 1925. Okay. And that's then, a picture of the altar area, is that yes, correct? Yes, yes. Okay, and then we have a picture of? St. Wendell Church as it appeared in 1967 with okay. the remodeling. Okay, so all the, all the altars are taken away. I have all these old altars on my wedding picture, and I did a retreat for some Boy Scouts, and we did the sacraments. And when we got to matrimony, one of them said, I thought you got married at St. Wendell. I said, I did. And he said, well, our church doesn't look like that. And I said, well, in 1949 it did. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so, very good. And then here we have some yes. more pictures. Excellent. Of the inside of St. Wendell Church. Okay, if you can tip it a little bit higher, that would be great. Now, come in on. Little, tip it down a little bit more, please. Oh, good. Thank you. Okay, very good. And we're looking to the east, is that correct? Right. Yes. Okay. Very good. That's the inside of the church, and then we have a picture of the outside of the church. Okay, that'd be fine. Very good. Good position. Okay. Excellent. Thank you. And then... Still? Oh, Kathy Wagner still. Okay, Kathy. It's a picture of St. Wendell Church. Okay. And these were sent out as Christmas cards by our parish priest and probably in the last three years. Three years. So back in 19 or in the 2000 or 1999? Yeah. Or okay. 2000, 2000 probably. His All name? Right. Father Gilbert Jacobs. Okay. He's a retired priest. All right. Now at De Pere. Okay. Very good. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Oh, please. Kathy Wagner. Yes. This is the stone that was in front of the church. Okay. And it has now been moved over across the street to the cemetery. Okay. With this part of it taken off, and it's the St. Wendell Cemetery. On oh, I see. Okay. And uh, okay, and the cemetery is uh, the cemetery located. Cemetery is, is located west of the church. West of the church. Okay. Right very good. The Thank you. Introduce yourself, please. I'm Francis Salm. And uh, talking about the cemeteries. Yes. Um, St. Wendell and St. George's are going to be part of the new church that was just built. Okay. St. Thomas. St. Thomas. Newton. Okay. And uh, then there will be also at a Northheim Cemetery, St. Cashmere's, and also St. Joe's. Okay. Which will all be run by the same cemetery association. All right. And the size-wise, the cemetery that was originally St. Wendell's is uh, what, approximately? Roughly two acres. Okay. Okay. Is there a chapel of any kind on that cemetery, or just stone uh, No, it's just, just stone. There is no, no building. Well, there's a little 
building for equipment on one corner. Okay. All. all right. Okay. Okay. Uh, you two gentlemen were discussing the veterans uh, on these cemeteries. Uh, would you like to indicate something there, please? Uh, Melvin Yanis, I believe there's about 40 some veterans buried on the Nordheim Cemetery. <clears throat> and here in St. Wendell, there's maybe 25. Okay. And some of them are already from the Korean War. Okay. But uh, World War II, World War I, that type of thing? <clears throat> I don't know about anything about World War I, but World War II, there were two of them in, at our stones on the St. Lemon Cemetery that were, I think, are buried in the Philippines, but they were killed in the Battle of Buddha, New Guinea. Okay. All right. Okay. Thank you. Anything else you'd like to add, Mr. Sun? Introduce yourself, please. I'm Francis Salm, and uh, as I understand, uh, <clears throat> Lester Hansen was the first fatality from Manitowoc County. Okay. We have three from St. Winnell's that were uh, from St. Winnell that got killed in the Second World War, and that would be uh, okay. Lester Hansen yes, sir. and uh, a shill. Okay. Shell. Alloy. Alloy shell. Okay. And who's the third one? Uh, Klein. Anna Klein. And I don't know what the first name was. First name? Okay. Don't have All right. Very good. Yes, sir. Uh, the Klein boy's name was Lawrence. Lawrence? Lawrence. Okay. Lawrence. Brother to Ted Elmer. Okay. Very good. Thank you. Please. I'm, I'm Charlie Bauer, and we're talking about St. Wendell Parish and. Uh, there were four parishes that joined together now that that formed the St. Thomas the Apostle Church, and one is St. Wendell, the other is St. Cashmere's out of Nordheim, and then there's St. Joe's over by Silver Lake College, and the other one was St. Isidore's out in Osmond. Okay. But with all these parishes, there there's more cemeteries. Now, in 1960, St. Fidelis Parish closed and that cemetery and that then people there went over to St. Isidore's in 1960. Okay. And, and since then, that closed now yes. and they went over to St. Thomas. So that we have two cemeteries there. We have the cemetery behind St. Isidore's and we also have the one in Spring Valley where St. Fidelis was located. All right. Them are the only two cemeteries I know of on, on my end of the thing here. And I know there's more cemeteries out there that's gonna be connected with the St. Thomas the Apostle Parish here. Okay. Thank you. You mentioned where that cemetery, where that new church is. Okay. okay. Even though. <laughs> St. Thomas Church is located on Bruner Road. Now, Bruner Road is a town road, but the main highway that goes past the, the west side of the church is 42, and it's real close to the intersection of County Road C and 42. In fact, I think you can almost see it from that intersection there. Yes, okay. And it's just in the first phase of the building project, the, the sanctuary part of the church is not built. The, the rest of the buildings are there, okay. including the priest house. All right, very good. And they do plan a cemetery there also, is right? That... The cemetery will be behind the church, which will be on the west side of the church, and it will be actually facing Highway 42. Okay. And it's on the south end of the cemetery now. There's a personal family crypt there by Burles, and that structure is up and is complete. Okay. Thank you. I'm Kathy Wagner. And we have the St. Wendell Cemetery, which is across the street from St. Wendell Church. And we have the St. George, St. Johannes Cemetery, which is down in Heinka. Okay. Which was a part of the St. George Church. Okay, very good. And now these, these cemeteries, as I understand it, are going to be taken care of by St. Thomas. Okay, very good. Thank you. And I belong to the veterans down here at Cleveland. Yes, sir. We put out flags at Memorial Day. Yes. And on um, St. Casimir's, there's more flags put than anywhere else. I don't know just how many because Bobby Bohemschutz puts them out. Uh, <clears throat> down here in Heike with the two cemeteries, there's probably a few more. But there's St. George's and uh, our, there's, uh, yeah, and St. John's. Okay. 
So the two cemeteries there are side by side, the Lutheran and the Roman Catholic. Okay, very good. Thank you. Please. This is Charlie Bauer, and we're going to talk a little bit about St. Cashmere's, which is in Nordheim, which is almost on the lake. It would be east of the, the, the village of Newton there, and it's, a, it's a, basically a Polish community. Okay. And there's a cemetery there, and we believe that the, that parish is by itself. Okay. And the cemetery is behind the church. Most cemeteries are behind the church. Okay. Very good. Thank you. Well, please. Uh, I'm Francis Salm. Uh, as far as I know of St. Joe's Parish, is an old, old parish that the church has got to be way over 100 years old. Okay. Uh, it's right next to the Silver Lake Convent. Okay. So as, and they use the same driveway as the convent. So they bought that St. Joe's Parish from when they merged with St. Okay. Thomas. Okay. So the uh, St. Uh, Joe's Parish has their own cemetery? That's right. And uh, that was the original? Yes. At, at this, with the information we have available to us at this time? Yes. Okay. Thank you. I'm Florence Chris, and yes, this Florence? is a picture of St. Vidalis Church and St. Vidalis School, and that's where I went to school. And that was located where? In Spring Valley. In Spring Valley. And uh, I made my communion every graduated okay. school there in church. And uh, was that a multi-room school? Uh, that it was they... a two-room school. Two-room school. Yeah, there were other four grades in each room. Okay. And. Well, I don't think there were more than about 40, between 40, 50 pupils. Okay. Most of the classes had two, three, four, maybe six. Our class where I was in, yes. we were always 10 or 12. Okay. We were the biggest class. You were the biggest the class. In the okay. whole eight years. Oh, okay. And what years did you go there, if I may ask? Gee, I have to think back. <laughs> uh, well, I started when I was six. Okay. From 1926, okay. when I graduated in 37. All right, very good, so. very good. And are those buildings standing today? That's all gone. That's it's all gone. gone? That all went back to the farmer. Oh, okay. And again, this is where Charlie, there was a cemetery there too? There's a cemetery there, yes. Okay, very good. Okay, thank you very much. This was a mission. Please. Hey, Wagner. Four churches, um, St. Joe's at Alberno. Yes. <laughs> Escapes me. St. Wendell at Cleveland. Yes. St. Casimir at Northheim and St. Isidore's at Osmond are all coming together as okay. as St. Thomas the Apostle okay. Catholic Community on Highway off of Highway 42. All right. And at the present time, bids were taken for the, all of them. The only one that we know for sure was sold to the convent, and that was St. Joe's. The rest of them, we have not been told who purchased or for what kind of money or anything Okay. until the deals are all settled. Okay, very good. And uh, today's date is what? December 9th. December 9th, 2002. Two. Okay, very good, thank you. Okay, we have a scene here and uh, it shows a vehicle uh, mired in a lot of mud and things and horses and people pushing and sh pulling, trying to get it out of the mud on this road. And I believe I've been told it's Highway 17, if you want to call it a highway. And it says, the good old days, you're on the wrong side of the road there, Pa. And it's, it's a scene on the road near St. Wendell, Wisconsin. I'm Kathy Sixel, and I live on County Truck, uh, County Trunk X, going to School Hill. Okay, very good. Thank you. I'm Melvin Yenis, and I live in the village of Cleveland on Linden Street, and I was born about three mi miles northwest of Cleveland. Okay, very good. Thank you. And you, sir? I'm Francis Alm. I was, um, I live on the County Line Road, okay. just south of Cleveland. Okay. I live on property that I was on the same farm that I was born on, which has been in the farm for 150 years. Wonderful. Thank you. Very good. And you, sir? I'm uh, Frederick Jacoby, and I presently live in Manitowoc, but I grew up on a farm just three miles north of the village of Cleveland. Okay. Very good. Thank you. And you, sir? I'm Vernon Chris. I live in Cleveland, across from the Manitowoc County Highway. Oh. Very good. Thank you. 
And you, ma'am? I'm Dolores Chris. I belong to him. <laughs> <laughs> and you're living together, right? Yes. <laughs> same, same spot. <laughs> Thank you. Very <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> and you, ma'am? I'm Marie Pippard. I live in the Linda Street Apartments in Cleveland. Lived here all my life. Right. But not in those apartments. Not in those apartments. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. And who do you hear, please? I'm Florence Chris, and I live in the village of Cleveland, the oh. east side. Okay, very good. The hike is suburb. And you, sir? I'm Walter Chris, and I live on the east side of Cleveland, what used to be Hika. Very good. Thank you. And you, ma'am? I'm Kathy Wagner, and I live right next door to Wally and Florence. Oh, okay. <laughs> on Washington Avenue. Wonderful. Thank you. And who do you hear, please? Dorothy Anderson, and I live on, uh, in Hika. Okay. Down east of event here. Okay, very good. Thank in you. In the house I was born and raised in. In the house you were born and raised in. Wonderful. And who live here, please? I'm Charlie Bauer, and I live in Newton on Highway C. Okay, thank you. And I'm uh, Jerry O'Neill, and uh, I live on Range Line Road in the town of Newton also. So I do thank all you folks for attending this evening, and your information is uh, really appreciated, and the good memories and thoughts you put together are great. And I think I'd like to have Kathy kind of sign us off here with a little bit of review. Cole, <clears throat> I want to thank everybody for coming, and especially on such a cold evening. We have uh, discussed the village of uh, St. Wendell right now, and I think we've covered everything, and the most uh, major part is the church, of course. Okay. What has happened to the church, and uh, if there's anything anybody wants to add at any time, please tell us, and we'll keep adding it to the tape. Okay. Thank you, everything, and have a good, safe journey home. Thank you. Introduce yourself, please. I'm Kathy Sixel, and we will have our next meeting January 13th, and we will meet again at LTC, and um, we will um, have the topic of Cleveland, the village of Cleveland, downtown Cleveland. Okay, very good. Thank you. Time will be 6 o'clock. Okay. Fine with everybody? That's the second, uh, the, third, uh, the 13th. 13th of January. Okay, and that will be at LTC. And 6 o'clock, yeah, okay. Monday, the second Monday. All right, and you will be sending out some kind of uh, reminder? Yeah, I'll send out a reminder again. That appreciated very much. <laughs> <laughs> and if anybody has a good reminder, a photo that nobody's That's seen, good. Yes. that'd be real nice. I will use it then if you get it to me. Very okay? good. Okay? Thank you. Okay.